My name is Peter Hessler. I'm working on implementing the bidirectional forwarding detection protocol for OpenBSD. Um, I apologize for my voice. I have a bit of a head cold that I've been working on. So um, to tell you about BFD, we have to tell you about the life before BFD and what problem is it trying to solve. Um, BFD is a, is a protocol that is designed for like big iron routers for connecting one router to another and making sure that there is a full data path between the two. Um, traditionally, what you do is you have a single Ethernet cable that you plug in to each router and they're right next to each other. So you just can depend on the link state of this, of this, of this, um, of the connection. You, in a fiber connection, you see the light from both sides or in a copper Ethernet, you see the electrical co connectivity. And this is pretty common. But you cannot always depend on this. Maybe there will be a failure in the connection that, that keeps the link up, but the machine is actually down. Or there may be active devices in the path between you and your neighbor. Um, a common case would be like if you're at an internet exchange and you want to, and you're connected to the switch at the IXP, and then your neighbor that you want to talk to is connected to either the same switch or even a different switch at that IXP. Um, or you have a, a long reach dark fiber cable between you and them, and there are active paths in the middle that will always show you a uh, link state. Yeah, good. The echo is pretty rough. Well, that, means you're telling, that means you're telling my recording. <laughs> ah. The recording works. Same as the mic works. Yeah, but my CD recording in the back. Oh, uh, oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. So, what is BFD? Um, it's a collection of RFCs. There's two that are mandatory to implement. Uh, the first one simply defines bidirectional forwarding detection. And what it does is it does a health check on the actual forwarding plane of the two devices. Um, for those of you who've been doing a lot of networks and have been using tunneling, it works similar to GRE Keep Alives, and where it just sends a hello packet every so often, and then it receives the, the response of, yes, I got you. Um, it is protocol independent, so it can work on anything. In the wild, uh, I've seen it most commonly used in association with BGP. Um, an interesting thing about the original BFD RFC is that it doesn't tell you what the packet is in. It is just a, a set of data that you, that you continue. And so the, the RFC that directly follows it talks about actually implementing it inside of an IP packet. And in that case, it's just a simple, simple UDP packet with um, a well-known port and it just, you just pass it back and forth that way. Um, the reason why they split it up like that is so you can, you can embed the BFD actual uh, features into any sort of packet you want. It can either be you know, something in OSPF or it can be in IP for just standard usage. It can be in Sonet if you want. It can be pretty much anywhere. Um, so why do you care? Uh, in the BGP, when you're checking the health of your neighbor, you, the, the timers are really commonly around 90 seconds to detect failure if your neighbor is no longer available. That can turn into a huge amount of data when you're at, when you're at high data rates. Like, like, how much is that at, at 10 gigabits or even at 100 gigabits? Like, this can be uh, just massive, massive problems for you. And one problem is that in BGP, the fastest you can do is three seconds, because the lowest you can do is one second, and you have to lose three packets in order for it to detect the other side is down. And as a side note, the vast majority of the big iron hardware that has 100 gigabit connectors can't do BGP packets every second, or uh, cannot do B, uh, BGP hello packets every, every second, um, because their, their, their standard CPUs have less computing power than this cup of tea. <laughs> so, um, as, as I said, uh, this is very commonly found on, on big iron uh, routers, like your, your high-end Cisco's, your high-end Juniper's, et cetera. Um, the specs talk about microseconds, and that's not milliseconds, the one that you're used to normally. It, it's the, the U, or the Mu, or whatever, the, the Greek S, not the MS. 
Yes. Um, because of how OpenBSD uh, is, is architected in the background, um, as an implementation detail, we are extremely unlikely to support anything faster than every 50 milliseconds. And even that is very aggressive. Um, for currently, for our use cases, that's not a big worry. Um, so there are, t there are two modes in BFD. Um, the first one is, is called asynchronous or, or active. And it's just your standard keep alive. You send, you send the hello, it sends back, I received it. And you just keep sending that back and forth. It behaves just like any other keep alive protocol you've ever heard of. The other one is on demand mode. And it is implementation defined, but what most, what most implementations are doing is they're actually monitoring the actual packet counters on that interface. And when it, and so as long as it's receiving packets from its neighbor, then it just keeps resetting the timer. If it hasn't received a packet from the neighbor, then it manually sends out the, the uh, hello packet, which when you are running at extremely high data rates or if you have a, a huge amount of neighbors um, configured on your system, this can be very beneficial because it lowers the amount of traffic that you have to actually generate and send out. There's some interesting and incredibly stupid parts of the spec. Um, this is a direct quotation from the uh, IPv4 and specifically within the UDP part. Um, it mandates which ephemeral port range the sending port must be. And it is not the standard ephemeral port range. This is the high upper ephemeral port range, which is a side note I discovered was defined because of FTP and ports in this range for FTP should not be firewalled. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, 1985 or whenever that was. <laughs> um, it recommends that the, the source port is globally unique for all of the BFD peers and that um, you can reuse it, but you should, you should minimize your reuse. But none of that matters because you must use um, the the uh, what is it the uh, the mechanisms actually built into BFD to identify which session is which. So we defined all these crazy rules, and unfortunately, you have to follow them because these are musts in the spec. But they ultimately just don't matter. Um, I discovered that this actually matters because if you don't set your port in that range, you cannot bring up against a Juniper. It, it's a must, okay, all right, I guess. Another delightful part of the spec is there is an optional encryption portion where you can uh, ensure that the packet you're sending your neighbor is the same as the packet they actually receive. And so they have two modes for most of them. Key, for, for SHA, the SHA-1 authentication is keyed SHA-1 and meticulous keyed SHA-1. And in this, the authentication header includes um, the, the type, the length, the sequence number, and the key itself. And then there's some magic done on the packet to, to encrypt it or to, uh, to hash it. For meticulous keyed, the sequence number must be incremented for every packet, which means for non-meticulous, it's optional. So even though the entire point of this is to avoid replay attacks, it's kind of an optional thing, whether you're avoiding a replay attack or not. Um, as a implementation detail, we will always increment the sequence number, even if you're in the non-meticulous mode, because that is legal. You're allowed to inf increase it anytime you want to. And just for receiving the packets, we'll just have to have, if it's non-meticulous, then it's allowed to equal the last one. Um, interestingly, the, both of the RFCs are full of these sort of very interesting, uh, interesting requirements. Uh, it seems like 
I get, I get the real feeling it was hardware engineers who worked on this on these specs, and not necessarily network engineers. The lo large parts of it were, if you read it, you get the feeling it was really imp easy to implement this into an ASIC, but doesn't actually matter on the wire. It doesn't match what a, a software engineer would, or like a, a software-based uh, network engineer would, would expect. So currently, um, I've implemented all the musts of the 5880 and 5881, which is the, the base BFD implementation and the um, single hop IPv4 and IPv6. Um, I can do a turn up against a Juniper device, and I can do, I can do um, all the regular health checks with that, and when I, I pull a link, I, I, see the fail, I see it fail correctly within the appropriate amount of time. Um, I can do, it's all the, the basic configuration options are there. A few bits, a few bits are hard coded just because I haven't felt like actually dealing with that yet. Um, some basic logging, quite a few, quite a bit of this will need to be removed because it's still printf debugging, printf development style. Um, I am using route messages to indicate uh, certain stat, certain. Uh, stat, state changes within BFD, which I'll go into a bit uh, later. Um, and nicely, because of the mechanisms I'm using, uh, even though this is entirely within the kernel, you can use PF to block or otherwise manipulate the packets. They show up as regular packets. They enter the, the, all the regular interfaces. And I'm not bypassing, I'm not bypassing the stack to, to either send or receive which definitely simplifies my life a lot and, and keeps it to a generic solution for making that fast as opposed to, oh God, I have to process every single packet received on the interface. Um, in my development for this, I was, there was a lot of exploration that needed to happen to fully understand all the details of this. Um, this is one of the first time I've implemented a network protocol actually in the kernel so there was a lot of just kind of poking exploration. Um, one of the original designs from us was to do uh, interface to interface for your standard, uh, your, your standard link between two routers. And so the ob and because we have a number of pieces that support um, interface uh, link manipulation then it seemed like that would be a very good place to start to at least get it up, get it running, and, and to get that working. Unfortunately, as I was implementing it, I discovered that manipulating the interface state was at the exact same place as, as um, interacting with the actual route state itself. And since one of my end goals was to get this to have uh, on an IX, where I can connect to multiple peers at the same time, I decided to just skip working on the interfaces itself and move it all into, um, into the, the routing subsystem. Um, so because of that, uh, I've ended up uh, migrating it to the, to the route, routing subsystem. Um, this is definitely a much better location for it because it's almost exclusively to do with the next hop IP address, with your, your neighbor IP address that you want to send all of your routes across. And you want to send all your routes to that, that address. Um, in the OpenBC kernel, when we notice that the next hop neighbor IP address is no longer accessible for whatever reason, then we have all these uh, built-in mechanisms that will mark it down. It'll say this is, this is an invalid next hop, and then either the built-in um, kernel routing table will just fail over to whatever is the whatever has been overlapping route, or it'll signal to a um, a routing daemon such as BGPD, and then BGP will then make its uh, will, will recalculate all of the routes because its next hop is no longer valid, and it'll be able to redistribute the routes as appropriate. Um, as an addition, so as I mentioned, that the the interface. Uh, link state was as equally as difficult to work as as the route next hop link state. 
Um, I tried working with that, but this is hard coded in quite a few places, so I decided just to, to punt on this problem, and I'll come back to it at a later point in time. What I did do was I was able to, I created two new uh, route flags that I'll be using to signal the BFD state. Um, for now, because it kind of matches and I have both upper and lower case available, I decided to use F as my BFD uh, state. Capital F is, is when it's up, lowercase f when it's down. Um, and I also have some special route messages that allow me to tell that I can announce that the, um, the specific details of that BFD state. So that way uh, an application that cares, such as uh, BGPD, can then monitor that and then not have to decipher all of the, the route flag messages itself. And it can, excuse me, can listen only for those, those messages globally as opposed to listening for just a subset of nets. Um, so, so I've run into some very interesting problems. Um, I had an interesting, interesting problem originally where I was um, leaking an mbuff for every packet I received, which created a really interesting thing as at almost exactly 90 minutes after I brought up the session, we would panic because we'd ran out of mem memory. <laughs> and it's just, it was just strange that it was almost exactly like to the second 90 minutes after I brought up the session. <laughs> um, so after using your, your standard free functions, I was able to, to work around that. And now, <laughs> But now it's a very interesting thing where somewhere deep in SO receive, I receive a panic after about eight hours or so. Um, I haven't touched SO receive at all. So this will require some very interesting debugging to figure out what is going on there. Um, my guess is I'm stomping in memory somewhere. It's relatively easy to do. But since it's, it's nothing that I've touched, I'm confused. And it's always in SO receive somewhere deep inside it. Um, when I reconfigure BFD, either because I'm typing too fast at the, the, in my search in my shell, and enter before I actually read what, I, what, I'm, what command I'm setting, or if I just rerun it for whatever reason, <clears throat> it gets into a weird half configured, half unconfigured mode that, need, that needs to be fixed. Um, that's just a lot of looking at the details of how I'm, I'm spinning up the, and actually connecting the, uh, the BFD to the system. But since all of that will have to be completely rewritten when I migrate fully to the, to the route side, I'm not really super worried about that. Okay, so the, the question is, is what do I mean by manipulating or going, going to the route side? And essentially, so right now, I'm configuring everything with if config. And it is a pointer that hangs off of the, the um, if p pointer structure. Yeah, I, I can see some grimaces. And it's, as, as I said before, this is completely the wrong place. And so what my plan is, is to have this be, these will be attributes on the next hop. And then the, the actual user interface side will be within the, um, you'll, you'll, you'll configure it through route. Okay, yeah, so it'll be attached to a route. Because we'll have to have a route to whatever the thing that we're monitoring. Right. Mm -hmm. I can remove the BFD session from the Is that correct? Is that valid for the current version of all the other version of the session? Is that valid for the current version of the 
Correct. That is that is something that will need to be worked on, and right now in the implementation that's that's completely ignored for now. But when it's actually moved into into the route subsystem properly, is that knowledge will need to be maintained, and then we'll need to do we'll need to have some probably have some hooks for when we learn uh, identical routes and have not necessarily empath knowledge because empath is, is primarily for the, the where the priority is the same because in OpenBSD the way we implement that is if you learn through BGP you get one priority if you learn through OSPF you get a different priority if it's statically configured it's a, it's at a yet third different priority <coughs> and the lowest number priority would win and so yeah we would we would need to, to look at that and make sure that Make sure that we handle that case correctly. But po possibly, possibly, this is something that will. Uh, that he, yeah, those, those are details that we'll ha that that we'll have to pay attention to definitely. Right, so that's that's what I'll be doing with the the route message. Yeah. Right, Pre precisely. That's that is the situation that I'm in now. Okay. Is that with the the monitoring is because I, as I said, I'm I'm punting on that issue. I have the route message, and then anyone who will have knowledge of BFD, unfortunately I'll have to, we'll have to make small modifications to the daemons that care about this to understand it more. Um, we can also take a look at maybe integrating um, the BFD up down flag state as well. But yeah, this is, like we'll definitely have some special knowledge for those, those protocols, but then the question is, do we care about the, the static route? So if you, if you manually configure and you're not using a routing daemon, what happens in that situation? Like, if and or like if it's plugged in directly on the same subnet, right? But if that link is down, so if you unplug the cable, we see that and then we fail over the normal route elections in the kernel side. Yeah, so th this is how I'm, I'm doing it in some of my testing with, uh, against our Juniper, is exactly that. <clears throat> that only refers to routes that, are, that have a next hop of my BFD uh, destination, my BFD, my BFD peer. I'm also thinking about manipulating it so the BFD peer itself is offline. And that one, I, I agree, maybe we'll, we would be the only ones doing that. I want to look and investigate that a lot more before we would go into that sort of situation. Because if no one else is doing it, maybe it's not worth it. Right, right. Oh, 
Okay, yeah. So, so what we what we do in OpenBSD is that we have the different priorities. If we mark it as we mark it as not up, remove the up flag. The routes stay, <clears throat> but then they're no longer valid, and so we just remove it that way. Yeah. So that way, when the when the peer goes back up, they're then available, and you can, you can keep using them. I have state D solve the problem when I want to design this on my own. It doesn't necessarily solve it when I want to connect to other big iron implementations because trying to get someone to run if state D on like say their Cisco or their Juniper is not going to work out so well. Yeah. And then also the BF BFD is designed for the, the ultra, ultra high performance. As I mentioned, it's in, it's in milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. In limited ways. The the. Yeah, it can it can monitor routes. Checks, you have the relay mm -hmm. monitor, uh, right. Yeah. So that's a different thing than BFD, right? Because BFD is, as you said, you can do it uh, against existing infrastructure. E exactly. Exactly. This is something that you don't necessarily need to. The configuration is much simpler because you just say IP and go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's t it's telling the the other parts of the local system if something is accessible or non accessible. Um, <laughs> yeah, about 50% of the code I've written so far needs to be thrown away, needs to be thrown away very, very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the code the code's rather horrific right now. There's some interesting interesting naming schemes that I'm using, which are basically I'm copying the RFC. So that way I don't need to translate from RFC to my code and understand which is happening there. Yeah. It's um it's colorful. Colorful is a good word. Uh, at least at least there are no no intentional misspellings in it like like the HTML protocol or HTML spec. Uh, for, for for two for two primary reasons, one the performance requirements um, in user land it'll get it'll get um, dropped at, at high load, and then secondly I'm actually manipulating the actual route the, the the status of the route flags, and you can't really do that cleanly with it outside of the kernel. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so uh, the other thing is that this only supports one peer at a time. I have most of the framework to handle multiple peers, but I just haven't finished that yet. And since since I, once I realized it was the wrong place, I will migrate it somewhere nice, get that all working, and then start working on the multiple peers and multiple configurations because that will completely, completely change. Um, so just to give you a little bit of, uh, of the simple setup, um, this is kind of a, a uh, cleaned up version of if config output. Um, you see here you have two BFD lines. It tells me the source, which is my IP, destination, which is my neighbor. I'm in the active mode, also known as asynchronous, but that's a stupid name. Um, the, and we're doing it basically at one, one second for both the transmit and the receive. And the multiplier is three. 
the multiplier is an interesting bit where <clears throat> when the session goes down, you have to be up for the multiplier times the transmit uh, time frame. And then, and then uh, if you keep flapping, the multiplier increases it. Uh, and, how, and how often the, before it goes back up again. So if you, if you go up for three seconds and then you go down again, then you have to be up for nine seconds before it marks it up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, but it, it only, it, uh, th there are limits within it of how many times to, to multiply. I think it's just, you can only do it, you only multiply by itself a total number of times. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Um, so that, that's just a very simple, uh, this is completely wrong, completely the wrong place, as I said. It doesn't belong in if config, but I'll show you what I have. Um, oh, nice, it just barely fits. Um, so this is the, the routing table that I have. You can see here the, the capital F means that I have brought it up against uh, my neighbor. Um, that is a Juniper M MX80 in our test lab. Um, and then this is also the uh, Juniper uh, side that shows <coughs> um, the configuration. You can see it's been up for uh, almost an hour and a half. Um, shows a, a variety of information. Um, our so you, you set in the BFD packet, you set a discriminator, which is your unique session ID. Juniper, like the vast majority of people, just do I++ for every time they're, they're configured. Uh, we do arc for random. Uh, so that way it's, we, we try to make it non-predictable. And uh, the Juniper thankfully understands it and doesn't, doesn't fight too much about that. Um, future plans, fix the bugs, fix all the bugs, of course. Uh, yeah, as, as I said, we need to migrate from the interface subsystem to, to over to routing. Um, and as, as part of our discussion earlier, is that this, it's a much, much better place to put it because we're, we're actively care about routes and not necessarily which interface it's on. That being said, if it does change interfaces, then you mark it down and you redo everything It's appropriate. Um, the user interface, inter user interface, user um, experience is right now really bad. Uh, that clearly needs to become better. Uh, thankfully, I think I have enough information to be able to explain uh, what the all, what all the issues would be at, a, at an upcoming hackathon, so we can have a nice cat fight and argue about that. Um, definitely need to support multiple peers over the same interface. Uh, right now, it's limited to um, one source and destination on an, on uh, on one interface. Um, we can do multiple interfaces, but that only solves a small amount of the problem. Uh, we need to add support for the encryption, which is that meticulous and non-meticulous uh, features. Um, right now, they've only specified uh, simple, which is just a, a pre-shared key. Um, that you just split in. They also have an MD5, which I believe was a historical implementation, and then they support SHA-1. Uh, I have not looked very hard, but I didn't see any other uh, encryption met methods. Um, unfortunately, right now, SHA-1 is a must support. So we still have to deal with, with, that, uh, with, that, alg with that algorithm, even though it's not the, the best. Um, and, and as I said, we do want to work, or rather I want to work on the actual manipulation of the up-down states in the, in the routing table. Whether or not we do that is both a decision, both a, a decision that we should make and possibly a technical limitation that we would run into. Um, we do want to work on, on, on adding this knowledge into the various routing daemons so they can make their own intelligent decisions on, 
on the content and get them get them working. So that way they can they can do their own uh, route decision route, route decisions based on the BFD state. Um, possibly integrates into SwitchD, the XLAN, so that way um, those layers understand understand more about the actual connectivity to the various endpoints that they, they're trying to talk to. And that way we can signal this in a way where it, it brings the, um, so we, we would know when, when one of them is up or down. Um, there's also a multi-hop feature uh, available in BFD. And that allows for very interesting things where you can say, I want to monitor this IP then I have three possible routes to it, and you actually health monitor each of the three different routes. Um, because it's standard routing, you can only make decision based on the first next hop. If they all converge after that and go through the same path, you can't really do much about that. Yeah, that would definitely be, be very, very handy to, to have is, yeah, the, the the comment was, the one of the local providers, Bell Canada. Yeah, Bell Canada, your BGP session is a multi-hop session. <laughs> Canada's Canada's not that third world, but it's damn near. <laughs> yeah, telecom wise, telecom wise, of course, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> here, have a switch. Yep. That's frightening. That's. Yeah, th thankfully in Frankfurt we have no such issues. Um, a, another thing that I would really like to work on is a draft RFC, um, which I have the, the link there, is written by, uh, partially written by DKIX, which is the largest IXP in the world. And what this allows you to do is you signal, so you, you connect up to the route server, you tell the route server that you support BFD. All the other neighbors can receive this information and then when they also support BFD, then you automatically configure BFD between yourselves, and only then do you mark the next hop as a valid next hop route. And yes, so this solves a, a problem that used to be a very common in distributed IX internet exchanges, where you would have connectivity um, because your switch was up, and then the location where the route server was that was up, so you can connect to the route server. The other, your other peer would connect up to one of their route servers. The route servers could exchange information, but the data path just didn't work for a variety of very strange and weird reasons. But this allows you to verify that the peer you're, or the, the, the next top router you're talking, that you want to send traffic to, is actually up. And um, as I said in the, in the introduction, you, for your standard BGP session, you want to uh, monitor the health. You, you, you traditionally monitor the health with either keep alives or with the link state. Your, your link state's up. 
you're keep you're sending keep alive. You can talk to your to your neighbor, but then the traffic is just being black holed and being dropped on the exchange. And if you're dropping a lot of traffic, then or if you're sending a lot of traffic, that's a lot of traffic being dropped. And this allows for extremely fast and accurate uh, measurements of this. And it also guarantees that the uh, data plane and part of the control plane are going over the same same segment. And so that solves one of the, the major downsides of, of an internet exchange <coughs> and using and using route servers. There are a number of other issues why you may or may not want to use a route server, but this solves one of one of the problems. Okay. So the question is how does BFD cope with congestion? By design, it goes through the forwarding plane, and uh, through the data plane, not the control plane. And so if the router is congested, it will drop those packets. And so you may lose the link because it can't handle the traffic it's receiving. That is, it, it's, Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can. You can adjust. And so, well, when when you when you configure it, you say what the minimum and the maximum right. values are. And so there is a negotiation of the timers. I mean, it's, it's yes, they do, Henning. Right, there, it, it tests quite a bit of the forwarding path, but not 100% of it, which is unfortunate, because that was, that was the design behind it. And I think it's, on the bright side, it does detect when the actual remote site is up. So if your remote site has crashed, then you know, thankfully it goes down at that point. But there are, there are some limitations about how about where exactly is processed, and, and yeah, as as I said, like okay, this cup of tea now empty, and like it still has more computing power than most of the the routing CPUs of those devices. Yeah. I glanced at the RFC and said, oh, different RFC. <laughs> I'm putting you aside for now. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, doing it over, over um, yeah, aggregated links, trunk, lags, whatever. <sighs> Essentially, you need, to, you need to monitor each member. And I'm not sure, but I think in that case, then it is encapsulated inside special special Ethernet frames, and not necessarily within UDP itself. So that's, that's one of the reasons why they've extra, um, extracted it out and made them different, different RFCs. That is definitely something we'll have to look at, and, but I have, I have designed the code in a way where the actual BFD processing and monitoring, it basically, it takes, it takes the configuration, or it takes the, um, what should I be encapsulated in as, as an external thing, so it just it still works independently and just uses whatever method that you gave it to do. Yeah. Ooh, fun times. 
Fun times. If, if, if it's easy to do in hardware, it should be hard to do in software. Yep, pretty much. Yep. So thankfully, that's uh, right at the end. Are there any more questions? Well, the, the value add there is that you can tell that if, if, you're, if you're aggregating like 10, 10 gig links and you go from, from 100 gigs total to 90 gigs total, you want to know that and you want to be able to make decisions based on that. And you have a kitchen sink, so you want to solve everything with the kitchen sink. And like, like LAC, LACP binds them together, but doesn't necessarily, it doesn't give B, BGP this information. It doesn't tell you when it's degraded, so to speak. Yeah, right now it it's, 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 that's completely out of scope for now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. No, because I just want to say I have seen some lag cases where you lose two lag, and you can tell because you get no traffic back. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you have a previous user on Juniper, you don't realize it. So you're splitting your traffic four ways, ways across four lags, and you're getting, and the other one <coughs> realizes it, and you're only sending two back, so you're losing 50% of your traffic. Um, right. Yes, welcome to the internet. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. If you push traffic to this BFD BGP over to LACP, you come to know whether you have migration or whether it's at all still on that. Right. Well, well, part of the part of the concern there is that how does the how does LACP do the hashing, and are you getting lucky and just going over just the one link that's working, right. but you're still losing. The other end links. Right. So thankfully, it's not listed as a must within RFC 5880. So maybe we'll support it, maybe we won't. Uh, question in the back. Yeah, and, and since, it, since it has knowledge of the, since, since the other side has to actively respond back over the same link. Don't, don't yeah. Press a little bit there. Yeah. Some questions like plus an application to the double pin. In the case of hardware providers, you can't open the app book until the cell phone is fully plugged in. Like yeah. Laptop, it's just, it's part of the app. The biggest thing is how you were mentioning how LACP is just like wrong to say that you can use the application to say, ah, this works well. Right. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah, and either that or you may have interesting resp results over trunk. Yeah. So, other questions? All right, thank you.